Chapter 4 The Salian Stazi and the Exodus, A.D. 36 Following the disappearance of the body and the ascension of Christ, an evil, brooding passion for vengeance seized upon the ruling priesthood of the Sanhedrin. In secret conclave, they plotted and planned a campaign of unremitting persecution against the followers of the Way. Maliciously, they determined to exterminate all who failed to escape their bloody hands. There is no greater hatred than in a divided house or brother against brother. In the main, the victims of the Sanhedrin were of their own race. The hatred they bore for the followers of the way was far greater than the implacable hatred that had divided the kingdom of Israel before the captivity. At that time, the ten tribes under Ephraim had drawn north into Samaria, while the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, with a few Levites, remained at Jerusalem. A wall of bitterness existed between them that was never removed. After each regained their freedom, the Ephraimites commenced their long march beyond the Euphrates, disappearing from scriptural history to become known by other names. Now it was more than a bitterness. It was a blind, cruel, unreasonable, black hatred. The Stazi the Sanhedrin formed was specially organized under the appointed leadership of the vengeful Saul. He wasted no time. He struck quickly and viciously. Followers of the Way found in Jerusalem, be they Greek, Roman, or Jew, were openly or in secret alike struck down. No mercy was shown. The records of that time state the prisons were overcrowded with their victims. The first notable victim Saul seized upon was the man whom he considered to be his inveterate foe, Stephen, the courageous leader of the Liberal Party who led the brilliant defense of Jesus on that fateful night in the court of the Sanhedrin. Along with Peter, John, and others, Stephen had taken up the scepter, defying the Sadducees by victoriously preaching the word throughout the holy city. Thousands were daily converted and later, according to St. Luke, reached the spectacular number of three to five thousand daily. This testimony dissipates the idea that the Jews were unresponsive to the magic appeal of the way. The Jews were the first converts, a fact which further infuriated the corrupt Sadducean priesthood. Fate quickly caught up with Stephen. The Jewish minions of the Sanhedrin stoned him to death in the manner peculiar to Jews as Saul looked on. He perished by the gate that still bears his name. St. Stephen was the first martyr for Christ, A.D. 33. So fierce was Saul's vindictive purge that he wrought havoc within the church at Jerusalem. The boundaries of Judea could not confine him. Illegally, he trespassed far within Roman territory where he hounded the devotees without censure or interference from Roman administration. No doubt the Romans felt Saul was doing them a service and a good job in ridding them of what they considered an undesirable religious pestilence. Throughout this reign of terror, Joseph remained the stalwart, fearless protector of the disciples and of the women. On every possible occasion, he stood between them and their enemies, a veritable tower of strength. Saul's fury knew no bounds. Strive and scheme as they may, Joseph's position as an influential Roman official defied the Salian Stazi from molesting his person or those whom he defended. Nevertheless, it became a losing battle. Within four years after the death of Christ, A.D. 36, many of the devotees were scattered out of Jerusalem and Judea. There is little doubt that the ships of Joseph, coordinating with the Christian underworld, carried numerous of the faithful in safety to other lands. He spared neither his help nor his wealth in aiding all whom he could. Calloused as the Romans were with their own specific brand of brutality, even they were shocked by the ferocious atrocities of the Sanhedrin Stazi. Out of this evil sprung the cause of their own ultimate doom. Later, the Romans turned into a two-edged sword, becoming the rabid persecutors and executioners of both Jew and Christian. Saul was to meet a cruel death at their hands. For the Judean Jews, the culminating catastrophe occurred in the year A.D. 70, when Titus, son of the Roman Emperor Vespasian, massacred them at Jerusalem and put the ancient city to the torch, leveling it to ashes, as Jesus had foretold. Those who escaped were scattered to the four corners of the world, despised and hated, forced to live in ghettos, and never to return to Judea. The Christian persecution was to continue for centuries in an increasing diabolic form. Tiberius proclaimed an edict, making it a capital offense to be a Christian. Claudius and other Roman emperors repeated the edict. 
The Romans, noting with alarm the rise of Christianity, began to consider Christians a menace to their empiric safety, therefore a class of people to be exterminated. History proves, with a mass of blood-stained evidence, how they strove their level best to crush the evangelistic movement. It was like striving to push back the waves of the sea with the palms of their hands. It was not to be. As prophecy proclaimed and history has fulfilled, the cross was to triumph over the sword. According to Acts 8, 1-4, in AD 36 the Church of Jerusalem was scattered abroad. Even the apostles were forced later to flee. This was the year of the epical exile, when the curtain descended darkly upon the lives and doings of so many of that illustrious band. Modern Christians are chiefly familiar with the New Testament record of the favored few, Peter, Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, with passing reference to but a few others. What became of the rest of the original twelve apostles, the seventy whom Christ first elected, then what of the later one hundred and twenty? They are the lost disciples on whom the scriptural record is as silent as the grave, particularly the two most outstanding characters, Joseph of Arimathea and Mary, the mother of Jesus. The sacred pages close upon them in that fateful year of A.D. 36, leaving not a shadow or trace of their mysterious passage into permanent exile. Ponder the facts. Christ's mission lasted but three years. Four years later, the elect had fled into exile. The Great Crusade was ended in but six years. True, some disciples labored later there in Judea, but the effects were transitory. Roman rule tightened down with a mailed fist on both Jew and Christian. Within thirty-five years, the holy city was to be a rubble of ruins and thereafter largely occupied by the heathen and unbelievers. Christianity had its birth in Christ in the Holy Land but not its growth that flourished to convert the whole world. This sprang to its full glory in another land. How could this happen? You may search the scriptures in vain for record of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John ever being near this distant country. The journeys of Peter and Paul, as described in the Bible, do not seem to give any clue. Then who performed this monumental Christian evangelistic work? Jesus provides the answer as he denounces the Sadducean Jews telling them that the glory shall be taken away from them and given to another. Citation, Matthew 21, 43. Again, when he says he came not to the Jews, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Citation, Matthew fifteen twenty four. He knew he would not convert the Sanhedrin and its following, so it had to be others, the lost sheep. Who were they? The answer lies in his commission to Paul, the converted Saul, who he commands to go to the Gentiles. Personal Note The word Gentiles is simply a translation for the word nations. Nations could be referring to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who had been taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 536 BC and had made their way into Europe. To what Gentiles did Paul go apart from the Romans? Or did Paul commission others of the illustrious band as missionaries? The answer has to be somewhere. The Romans did not Christianize the world. They were the greatest enemies of the Christian gospel for over 300 years after the death of Christ. Who crushed this Roman opposition that made Rome Christian? Many are the intriguing questions that can be asked, all of which would seem to deepen the mystery that revolves around those who can truly be called the lost disciples. We find the answers by studying ancient writings, the old martyrologies and monologies, the old parchments that have reposed in great libraries for many centuries, filed away, and for almost as many centuries completely forgotten. These and the works of eminent scholars who have explored the great scrolls and deciphered the contents reveal the astonishing facts. That is the object of this work, which at best can only quote briefly from the mass of data available. Where scriptural history ends, secular history begins, and in using the word history, we find greater faith and strength in understanding the original meaning of the word. As one great story stated, there are sermons in stones. Equally so, there is revelation in words. 
The Bible was God's book of history, the Word of God. In the Old Testament, history is given to us in prophecy, and in the New Testament demonstrated in fulfillment. Therefore, viewed in this light, the true explanation of the word history as we employ the word is, prophecy is history, his story, foretold, and history is prophecy fulfilled. Fulfillment of his story began in the advent of Christ and will continue until the whole world accepts him. Even we Christians have yet much to learn, but Jesus said it would become known unto us all as we are ready to receive. All those who are inclined to consider the gospel of Christ a mystical, intangible, or incredible story founded on myth and superstition with no substance to his existence will find solid evidence in tracing the footsteps of the lost disciples from the exodus of A.D. 36 when they passed out of biblical history into secular history particularly the events concerning Joseph of Arimathea. While there are many learned minds dating from the era of Christ onward who provide the same record, there is a special advantage in quoting a more modern authority with the eminent ecclesiastical background of Cardinal Baronius, who is considered the most outstanding historian of the Roman Catholic Church. He was the curator of the famous Vatican Library, a man of learning and a reliable facile writer, Quoting from his Ecclesiastical Annals, referring to the exodus of the year A.D. 36, the mystery is solved as to the fate of Joseph of Arimathea and others who went into exile with him. He writes, quote, In that year the party mentioned was exposed to the sea in a vessel without sails or oars. The vessel drifted finally to Marseille, where they were saved. From Marseille, Joseph and his company passed into Britain, and after preaching the gospel there, died. End quote. No doubt this event in British history will come as a surprise to many Christians, but there is a mass of corroborative evidence to support this historic passage by many reliable Greek and Roman authorities, including affirmation in the Jewish Encyclopedia under Arles, A R L E S. The studious pronouncement made by Cardinal Baronius, derived from delving into the treasured archives of the Vatican at Rome, has proved to be as incontrovertible as it is revealing. To my mind, the Vatican would be the first to repudiate any testimony from their archives to support the priority claim of Christian Britain, if it were untrue. The interesting part of the Baronius report is that the date coincides with that given in the Acts of the Apostles. The expulsion of Joseph and his companions in an oarless boat without sails would be in keeping with the malicious design of the Sanhedrin. They dared not openly destroy him, and instead conceived an ulterior method, hoping their ingenious treachery would eventually consign Joseph and his companions to a watery grave. Little did they realize that, by this subtle act in ridding themselves of the outstanding champion of Christ, their very hope for destruction would be circumvented by an act of providence. Their perfidy made it possible for the forgotten fathers of Christianity to congregate in a new land where they would be free of molestation. The Salian Stazzi had failed dismally and for the last time. It began to collapse completely when vengeful Saul, on the road to Damascus, was stricken blind. The incredible happened. Saul heard the voice of Christ speak to him and had his sight restored. He was converted to the faith of the way. The news stunned the Sanhedrin, infuriating them beyond measure. Immediately they ordered an all-out drive to seize Saul and kill him on sight. A reversal of circumstances. The hunter was hunted. He went into hiding, appealing for aid from Christ's disciples. Their reluctance to save him is understandable. They were filled with suspicion as much as with surprise. Finally, they complied, lowering him over the walls of the city with a rope. Citation Acts 9.25 Making his escape in the company of the disciples. From then on, he became famous as Paul. The rest is well known. He took up the cross with his great commission as given to him by his Redeemer Christ and with all his heart. Finally, he gave his all to his master in martyrdom, leaving behind an unblemished record which marked him as St. Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles.